All right, here we are. I always have to have two computers going so I can even uh, find out what's going on. So, uh, all right. So, today I'm joined by Yaz, a.k.a. Ninja Parade on Twitter. How are you, Yaz? I am very well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm also joined by the one and only David Hemphill. Hi there. How are you, David? I'm excellent. That's good to know. <laughs> David, it sounds like you're not wearing a shirt. Uh, we'll leave that to the listener to decide. <laughs> huh. So, Strange. Um, the last time that we were kind of working on stuff related to this, we were building out this kind of cool little, cool little thank you page thing here. Let's get rid of some of these... Uh, tabs here um if you go and uh check out like purchases one you know here's someone who bought something and everything seems to like generally work or whatever so there's a couple things that we could do i made like a a list um so one thing was this purchases url kind of sucks like purchases one is supposed to be like a private url that only the person who bought can see it seems highly guessable um, another thing was a little bit of refactoring that I can demonstrate. Uh, the bigger thing though, that maybe would be a fun thing to do is building out, um, either webhook logging. So like right now, whenever someone buys something and it makes a webhook back to the server to say that, you know, a purchase came through, I don't do any logging of the request or the response. So if it fails, like, you know, it failed. Um, it's gracefully handled on my end, but like there's no tracing of that or history, so someone can't really find out what happened. So I'd like to add that. I also wanted to be able to like email um, people whenever a webhook did fail, like email the creator of the product. So that is the uh, the other thing. So I don't know what sounds interesting to you guys. I'll let Yaz share his opinion first. Kind of like the idea of the webhook logging one, but... All right. David? Yeah, that sounds great. Webhook logging it is. So let's take a look at some tests. So if we look at this purchasing products test, uh, purchasing product test, here's kind of the one that I generally use. Uh, this is the main happy path test. So... We verify that a webhook was delivered, and uh, in the case that it fails, um, we don't really do anything related to the webhooks. We just kind of program uh, the webhook dispatcher to fail. So let's think about, I guess, what we would even want to do to kind of start it with a test. So um, I think. Ultimately, if we want to log all responses, then we need to save those somewhere. Now, what I'm trying to decide is, does it make sense to have an assertion here to make sure that we log the delivered webhook? Or does it make more sense to do that inside the webhook dispatcher? Um, so that since we're replacing it with a fake in this case, it wouldn't actually get saved. Uh, but then we'll update the tests for the webhook dispatcher to have that cause things to be saved, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I'm trying to decide. So let's look at some code and see if anything kind of feels like a neat, interesting way to do it. So we can think about maybe the best place to test it. This was the weird thing I was thinking about refactoring. Uh, if it succeeds, I do the exact same thing as if it fails. And you can see here, I thought this is kind of weird that this is the same shit. <laughs> um, but it's important. Like, I can't delete this because that exception might get thrown. It's just like we want to do the same thing uh, regardless, which to me is like kind of a smell. So one thing I was considering doing here was moving the exception handling into the purchase itself. Um 
so that this controller didn't really worry have to worry about exceptions at all anymore. So you know what? I think I want to do that anyways <coughs> before we get into anything else. So let's just write this or run this test to make sure everything's kind of gravy. And go ahead and look at our purchase class. So a purchase can fulfill itself, of course. Mm -hmm. Suck on that. <laughs> Uh, so it uses the webhook dispatcher through a, I believe this might be a real time facade. Yep. And uh, where is that method? <coughs> and it goes and delivers that webhook. And then when the response comes back, we update the actual purchase uh, to mark what the um, fulfillment URL was that came back from uh, the webhook. So I think like we could refactor this controller in the most naive way, basically we'd want to have a try here, a catch here. Now the thing that's kind of funky about this to me is it's like an empty catch. Um, because what do we even really need to do if it fails? You know, nothing. Yeah. You don't notify the customer that the webhook the webhook failed though, do you at this point? Well, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. Like, I can't think of anything actually useful that you would do here, which is what makes it kind of funky. But I bet if we do this now and run the tests again, they'll still pass. So let's just kind of get that proved. No. Um, Oh, probably just a namespace thing. I'm lower volume than my guests. So you guys are loud and I'm not. Let's mm -hmm. boost this a little bit. Make me like 120% volume. It might be because both David and I have our shirts off. I think that it amplifies the audio. That's true. There's Might less dampening. My chest. Yeah. Whatever. It's hard to do this audio balancing live between all this crazy software. Um, okay, so we're back to green. So what should we do if the webhook fails? Can I ask a question? Yeah. Because I've I haven't been part of this process the entire time. Um, so I'm assuming this is a successful sale. You hit the webhook for the customer. Yep. And so at this point, the sale is error. totally completely done. Like the yeah. sa sale is complete by this point. Yes. Um, so Stripe has been hit and all that stuff is sorted. Now all we're doing is basically saying make the webhook request so we know what um, endpoint to redirect them to. And it's not even a redirect. It's uh, you know what to make this link point to. Mm. So if that fails. Um, it doesn't really matter from the perspective of the controller. You know what I mean? Because we just kind of return the same response anyways and redirect to a new page for that purchase ID. Uh, it's just a matter of what's shown on this page that they end up getting redirected to that's going to change. But even that is mostly going to be logic in the template, I think. That's kind of my plan anyways. I'm just like not going to show this button uh, or this text. You know what I mean? I might yeah, just show right. some other thank you, generic thank you message. Because um, I don't want to like make the user think that something went wrong with their purchase necessarily. And I guess you can't really figure out the reason why the webhook failed from their response. Um, I mean, I could try and look, but there's not really anything I could do. Can't, it won't be reliable. Um, so I'm just trying to decide like, what do I really want to do if I catch it here? Like one thing that you could do that feels like kind of a cop out to me, um, that still f makes it feel like an empty catch essentially is like fire an event, you know? <laughs> so it's like, well, um, we tried to fulfill a purchase and it failed. So if that matters to anyone who's listening, you can, you know, react to that, which I think is probably something that we will need to do. Like, um, handling like that's how we're going to send like the emails and stuff 
could be how you log the the failure too. In your result, you seem like you wanna you could fire an event and just log the result no matter what it is. You know, two hundred, four hundred, five hundred, whatever it comes back. Yeah, but that thing that like looking at this code, I, th I feel like maybe belongs in this class because I don't want to um, have to log like the webhook result in two different places in this class when inside the webhook dispatcher look at this shit <laughs> zttp we got this little unless helper <laughs> just madness um but basically here i want to unconditionally log this you know what i mean like here right here we'd basically want to say like record the webhook response um, so that we have like the history of it and then check if we need to throw an exception for like any consumer who was expecting it to pass but it didn't uh, it's still kind of weird because I feel like I'm going to need to know like what purchase this was for and stuff and that information is not passed in because these classes that like interact with the outside world that I use from classes that are more like domain specific like the purchase I try to make them as ignorant of the app as possible you know so i don't really love passing in like a purchase instance to this class because all of a sudden it's starting to be like coupled with the app you know right. weird That's way i would think you would want to lift it up to the controller level because you're going to do it either way and it's an app level kind of logging and that brings it out of the web hook dispatcher you know, you're just kind of sending the the response or throwing the exception. Yeah, the problem is like the response from the webhook. I don't think bubbles like up quite that far because when mm -hmm. I fulfill the purchase, I don't return like the HTTP response that came back. Like those details never make it up here. Um, but. That's okay. So, I mean, maybe what would be interesting though is to is to handle like the situation of sending an email to the person who made the product when like the webhook failed. And that gives us like an excuse to like find something to put in this catch. I I I kind of I kind of feel like you you need the purchase information on a on a filled webhook. Like that information, that's that's information you should be logging. Like this purchase, this webhook failed, mm -hmm. especially especially if it can kind of impact that customer from getting their like the download link or whatever it is. I agree. It's just it feel it would feel weird to me to have like so the response comes back here, right? And this is yeah. if I'm not mistaken, literally just JSON, which yep, it is. is not quite enough in my opinion to log because I don't have the status code, I don't have the headers. Um, and I would like to log those. So if I did it here, I'd have to, you know, log the response here and then here I'd have to like, you know, get the response from the exception and log that just feels weird to log it in both places because like from the perspective of the log, the log doesn't really care whether the response is a okay response or a failed response it's logging them either way so it seems weird to have to put those pieces of code in different places you know it feels like what i want to do in an ideal situation is as soon as this response comes back um i guess in this little tap call here just like log the response unconditionally you know what i mean yeah finally up in that purchase you know, no matter what, just do it finally. I know, but it's weird because in one case, it's just a variable. In the other case, I have to unwrap it from an exception, mm. you know? And even then, yeah. I still don't have the headers and stuff. So <clears> I feel like... What if you type hint it? Sorry? What if I type hinted it? Ah, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I hear that has a really significant impact. It might make your test pass, I hear. Oh, yeah. Or I might be able to delete a lot of them. Like, for example, like this test that says what should happen if the webhook fails... If I was to just go and do like, you know, this should be a string, I think I can delete this test, right? Isn't that how it works? 
It's fucking stupid. All right. Spicy. <laughs> um, okay, so I think uh, what would be an interesting thing to do is work on the email thing instead of just sitting here doing nothing. So <laughs> I think everything's going to pass right now. All right? Um, so this fails, which is bizarre, and we don't do anything with it. People should feel uncomfortable with that. <laughs> I do. Uh, so let's say, okay. Move failed webhook exception handling into the purchase. Okay. Commit that. And uh, yeah. Okay. So if the webhook fails, I think the way I want to test that is not by testing that an email is sent, but instead just testing that like an event is fired. And then we'll write some code to uh, respond to that event and test that too. You think event versus job? It'll be an event that gets listened to and picked up that queues a job to send the email. You know what I'm saying? Hope slice. You, hear know, you. you know what I'm saying? Okay. Um, we're on a uh, version five, four of Laravel, which is fine, but I always, I just submitted a PR that I want to use, <laughs> but that's only in five, five, but I guess we can't do that. So, uh, let's just do event fake and fake all events. It's not ideal. And if the webhook fails, uh, let's look at the event fake, event dake, event fake. So assert dispatched event callback seems fine. So let's do events assert dispatched. Uh, what do we want to call this event that fires whenever um, a webhook? It's not so much that in this case, it's not so much like the webhook failed. It's more like um, the purchase was not fulfilled successfully you know because this is a different type of webhook than just like a regular boring like okay the, the webhook failed this is more like the fulfillment failed let's call it fulfillment failed exception what do you think yeah, anybody that's good. fulfillment failed event so it's just <clears throat> fulfillment failed okay and this is going to be uh, not a real class yet. So the uh, tests feature fulfillment failed event was not dispatched. So let's just go and try and dispatch one. Uh, let's do like fulfillment failed dispatch. And... Uh, We'll just do it like that for now, and then we'll think about figuring out how to track that it was for the right purchase and stuff like that. So what do we have here? Still not found, so let's do a, let's create an event. Artisan make event fulfillment failed. You gonna use the event helper? I'm gonna use the event helper inside the event. Just throw some more global functions up in yo shit. You know? <laughs> uh, import these now. And now I think we're going to get like some error, but like that's, oh, it works. That's hilarious. So I guess this is a real method that exists <laughs> on events now. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, dispatchable. I dig it. Seems pretty nice. dispatchable. <clears throat> This kind of broadcasting stuff kind of makes me uncomfortable in some ways. You can kill all that. Do I have to remove like a certain trade or anything? Like interacts with sockets? This, yeah. You can remove that. And the should broadcast. It does not interact with sockets. And the private this channel and all go. that stuff can be gone too. Okay. So let's. Yeah. This yeah. feels like more like what I want. Okay. Let's run that test again. Okay, fulfillment failed. So now I want to make sure that um, 
we know like what purchase it was for. So let's return event purchase is purchase use purchase. So we already have the purchase that actually succeeded, like the purchase itself succeeded, but the fulfillment failed. So this will just let us know that the event that was thrown, or that was fired, sorry, has a reference to the correct purchase, which I think seems important. Okay, so undefined property purchase seems fine. Let's head over to our fulfillment field and throw in a purchase. And do you make these public with events? You have to if you want to access it. Yep. Like in the listener? Like that's kind of the idea? To, yeah, to have yeah. access to event purchase, yeah. Would. Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to... What's like convention? I know like with um, Q jobs Or sorry... What is it? There's a bunch of stuff where Laravel has this like conventions for things that are public or automatically available in places like the uh, mailables are an example of that. I just didn't know if that same sort of like logic. Serializing and having it available in the handle method. Yeah. Okay, so I'm missing argument for that. So That's actually a good idea. We can pass this through. Does dispatch automatically proxy everything to the constructor? I mean, we could find out just by running the tests, I guess. So must. Dispatchable. Love it. That's exactly what I want to see. Have you, uh, do you guys know how pending dispatch works in Laravel? I don't. It is uh, some very magical stuff that people would, some people would get upset about. <laughs> Imagine that. So if you look at pending dispatch... <laughs> Um, you know, you'd think with like the level of coders and developers that are complaining about this stuff, running these big successful businesses that have less time on their hands to complain. Sorry, we're looking at the wrong dispatchable. I wonder if this actually does the same thing. Is there a pending event? No. Okay, anyways, pending dispatch, I'll still explain it because it's fun. So have you ever seen things in Laravel where you can do stuff like, here we dispatch this, right? Imagine this was a job. You could just dispatch it and it'll go to like the default job queue. Or you can say like on queue and then like some other queue, right? Yep. <clears throat> and at first glance, it seems like, okay, that's cool. That doesn't seem unreasonable. Until you start thinking about like, how is it possible that this even works? How does this put it on the queue right away, but then somehow you can change the queue after the fact? Like the, the only way that you could think that this would work would be if you had like a go method at the end or something. You know what I mean? Or, or like, you're on queue first. Yeah. yeah, like you're building up the thing fluently and then eventually like actually making it do the work. But <laughs> me and Taylor figured out that PHP makes a guarantee about when your destructors are called. So if you look oh. at pending dispatch, we use destruct <laughs> to actually dispatch the job. So if you were to ever like assign this to like a variable, um, it wouldn't get fired properly. <laughs> so never assign things that don't return anything to a variable uh, with some of these fancy syntax sugars that exist here. Um, but anyways, just an interesting tidbit. Okay, so that seems to like basically work. Uh, is there anything else that we would want to make sure of? I mean, does it seem like it would be useful to... It feels like there would be some sort of thing you would want here that like gave you a reference to the failure. So when I go to email the person, I can say like, hey, um, it failed and here's a link to go see like the log information or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. But to me, that means like we have to think of like a new type of object to exist. Um, and that thing would have to be already logged here. 
unless like the purchase can just like have a reference to it after it's done. Oh, man, it's kind of confusing. Yeah, okay. Let's not worry about it too much yet. Let's continue with our idea of wanting to be able to at least just send the email. Okay, so we have that set up. Now, this is actually an interesting question of where do we put um, where do we put a test for like this kind of like feature? Because it's kind of testing. Um, well, it depends how we want to test it. Let's make a commit first. Okay, fire an event when fulfillment fails. So one option is to create like a class that handles failed fulfillments, or right? like a fulfillment failed listener or whatever, mm -hmm. and just unit test that class. And um, then the, the tricky thing is always like, you know how you have to do, uh, where do you do like your event wiring up here, this provider? Yeah. So you can like bind some event and then the listeners that should be listening to it, right? If you want to like really have a test that prove that when you fire a certain event that a certain listener is run, um, you need to like write the test by firing the event and then checking like what happens when that event gets fired versus just unit testing the listener because unit testing the listener doesn't prove that you ever went into this class and wired the event up to the listener. You know, it'd be easy to have a green test suite and not have remembered to actually wire that up. I think I've actually done that before. Yeah. But if you're going to test it by firing the event, then it makes me wonder if it, it belongs in the unit folder or if it should be thought about as like a a feature on its own you know what i mean yeah i mean i guess you could test it like testing the route and then it's testing that the event was fired but don't really care about the details and then inside of your purchase yeah you like that. yeah that's what we're doing here we test the event gets fired and now i want to test like when i fire the real event so it makes me wonder like how if i want to have like even a a new feature test in the feature folder or if I just want to fire it from inside the unit folder. Let's try it as a unit test first. So we'll call it like the, um, it's not even a unit test, so to speak, but you know, whatever, it's fine with me. A unit so, of the app. Do you usually use those like just generic names for your listeners, like fulfillment failed listener test? It's usually like team test, user test, purchase. It's just test. like this class name kind of sucks to me. Like, I always hated like the coupling between like the listener name and the event name. To me, like that feels like it's sort of defeating one of the goals of an event-driven system, where it's not like this listener exists because of that event necessarily. It's like the thing that this class does isn't listen to failed fulfillments. It's um, notify customers when a fulfillment fails you know what i'm saying so like it's named after the event that it listens to instead of what it does in as a reaction to that event i like i like naming them as pairs knowing that that event is handled by this listener yeah. but it seems fairly mind. practical i guess so especially if you have a lot of events it keeps it clear yeah Laravel creates a listeners folder, I think. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so let's call this fulfillment failed listener test. Comments, what the hell? <laughs> Who needs them? Okay, so test um, the I I was struggling to come up with the 
kind of good terminology to describe the person who's like the creator of the product that's for sale. On the last stream, we landed on merchant, which seems accurate, but also kind of kind of felt like too paypal -y or something. Something about it, like, in hindsight, made me feel like this is too enterprisey and not fun enough. So I went with Maker is the name that I'm using now. Um, so Maker is notified when uh, a fulfillment webhook fails. Something like that. Seems like a reasonable. Very readable. Reasonable name. So I tried this on the last stream and I thought it was kind of kind of nice. So I'm going to do it this way again. Writing my tests backwards. So instead of starting with a setup and then the act and then the assert, starting with the assertion and then figuring out what we need to do to arrive at that assertion. So I think um, what we want to do is look at the mail fake and see assert sent okay so we want to be able to assert sent and how do you specify who it was sent to i can never in the callback in the callback correct mail fake has to yeah that's the sort of thing we're looking for okay cool. has to Oh, yeah, that's two. Ah. Let's see if that works. Z2, right? <laughs> okay, so um, what should we call the mailable? Fulfillment failed? Sorry, dear maker. Is it weird to have like multiple classes in the system with the same name where one is in the events namespace and one is in the mail namespace? I, I would say before, yes, but it it does feel weird. But then you get in the the thing where people are like creating like fulfillment folders, and then it's slash events slash failed. Yeah, you know it's like really stupid. I don't think I mind it because I don't know what else to call it. I think if I was going to do anything, I would actually like do what people some people dislike and just add like rename the current fulfillment failed event to literally be fulfillment failed event. And maybe I would call this like fulfillment failed email. You know, I don't like calling yeah. it fulfillment failed mail. Fulfillment fail whale. Yes. <laughs> Let's call it a fulfillment failed email. We'll just use like that, uh, suffix for everything so that things are easier to find. Like when you go and through here, so we're gonna have that. It's gonna have a full queen. Um a mail. What does Taylor call it here? A mail? That seems fine. And uh we're gonna assert return mail has to and we'll say like maker at example dot com will be our, our person. And we can think about like subject and stuff to add. So what's our um act phase going to be so kind of what we were saying before is the two approaches that we could take here is to either do like listener equals new fulfillment failed listener right and then do like listener um what is the method that, that you call on a listener is it handle yeah handle and then we, we could do like listener handle uh, new fulfillment failed event, you know, with a purchase and then verify that this happens. So that's like one way to do it, which is like more of a real unit ish test for this class. But that way doesn't force us to drive out that event wiring. So I think maybe what we'll do is we'll do it this way first and get it working and then demonstrate that like, uh, when we switch to the other way, we'll have a test failure. I think that would be like an interesting thing do it yeah okay so <sighs> fulfillment fail whale so this is our act phase we're going to need a purchase so let's think about how we make a purchase so a purchase is going to be equal to a factory purchase class create 
Although this could really be like a fancy mock or something, but we can think about that as an optimization after the fact. Right now we're not actually doing anything here, but we do need the product, I think. And we need to override that specifically, which means we need a, a product to create. And this is only because of the fact that we want to be able to know who the maker of the product is that was purchased, right? So we have to kind of go and do this whole chain. So this will just be user ID, but I'll call it maker here. Maybe I'll make a makers table and people will log in as makers. Have you, um, <clears throat> have you talked to Renick about his um, fixtures? Yeah, I was factories? talking to him about that when he was first starting in on that project. Uh, that he's Man, working it's on. such a great idea. That's what DHH does. Yeah, but what's what's crazy is how you how useful it is for actual real cedar cedar data as well. Yeah, it's nice because you don't like, do all this crap. I mean, the yeah. the trade off is so for anyone who's listening and wondering what like the difference between fixtures and factories is. Here we're using factories where at the beginning of our test we set up all our data ourselves. So you start from like a clean database every time. Um, this is good because it's explicit and it's easy to just look at a test and understand everything related to it. But the biggest trade-off is that it can be really slow because you have to create seed data every single time. Um, so a common approach that some Rails developers use, like Basecamp writes their tests this way, is they use this concept of fixtures where at the very beginning of the test suite, they seed the whole database with like kind of a, a world and it's expected that everybody on the team just sort of understands that world. And then you just start making assertions about that world based on different things that you do. Um, and a lot of the time you'll have assertions that rely on data that's in another whole file that you're just expected to sort of know. Um, so it's really fast because all the data is always already there and you don't have to set up new data every time. But it's less easy to like just look at a test and understand everything. You, there's sort of more... Um, I don't know, what do you call that? Just knowledge that you need to have from working on the code base for a while, usually. Yeah, I've it's, had, it's... I wanted this like functionality for a while. And in my brain, I call it like scenarios. Like in a certain scenario where you're, you know, a maker that has two products and this thing happens, <laughs> what happens? You know, that kind of test. So almost like a shared setup and then like different things that could happen with that world. Yep. That's kind of like an interesting blend between the two, it sounds like. Yeah, because like the app that we're working on, the the entire test suite is based on it being May twenty fifth at eight AM. Yeah. <laughs> and the in the entire and like there's like thirty five hundred test classes. And the entire time you're shifting that one date back and forth. So it it kind of it kind of blows your brain looking at it that way. Interesting. To kind of keep, yeah. Cool. So let's uh, pull in these things and get this running. So, sorry, Adam. No, it's okay. I just like, it's interesting to talk about, but I'm worried oh. that like we're just sitting here looking at a screen doing nothing. There's no table. Oh my goodness. And now there's a table. I thought this was like a podcast with a video. Not null constraint failed. Purchases amount. Interesting. Let's look at the model factory. Oh, I need to make a publishable product. I always forget about this. Publishable. Okay. I think would be cool about like a scenarios concept is that you could program different states in your app and then log in like if they were kind of like almost seeding database seeding you know sometimes you can run different seeders to get yeah like the type of user and stuff. you could do like something from the command line that just creates a certain kind of predefined state yeah like a namespace seeding scenario stuff okay uh Hmm. I'm worried this is going to do more work for us than I want it to. Like, it's going to hurt the point that I wanted to make before. So let me just check something here. No, it didn't. Okay. Good. 
there's no fulfillment fail listener we must import that class unit fulfillment failed so we'll need that event uh, no mail so we'll import the mail facade then make sure that uh, we fake all our mail fake the expected mailable was not sent good 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 let's go to our listener and uh, we could inject the mailer in the constructor here but why would we do that we could use a facade we could type hint the event here but why would we do that no reason yeah I want to write more it tests it seems dangerous but Okay, so let's just do like mail. Um, man, I can never remember the syntax for mailables off the top of my head. It still feels too new. Rrr, mail. Generating mailables. Where's sending mail? Let's go to the top. Sending mail. So we do mail to and send the new mailable. That's so funny, bro. Okay, um, and then we'll do uh, send a new fulfillment failed email. I'm going to just put the wrong email there so that our tests don't pass prematurely. <clears throat> Is that a valid uh, top level domain? <laughs> you asshole? I don't think so. You dash asshole? Okay, no mail facade. Pull that in run the tests no fulfillment failed email okay let's go ahead and uh, generate that artisan make mail fulfillment failed email go ahead and uh, import that run the tests the expected mailable was not sent because of a namespace issue this is the wrong file import run the expected at mail fulfillment. Hmm. Oh, because of the email. Okay, so let's put in, uh, and that's the same email there. Okay, cool. So we can make this pass by saying like maker at example.com, which is what I was about to do because I guess my brain is completely shut off and that passes. Uh, so now we need to get the maker email from the purchase. So if we were to say event maker email, don't want to break the law of Demeter, you know, because uh, I think this would be what event purchase product user email. Yeah, we are breaking the Demeter's law here, bros. So we can't be doing that. Uh, so if we do product maker email, chain gang. do you say the shame game? The chain gang. Oh. Sorry. We're playing the shame game. <laughs> Let's go to the product. And here where we have this user. Yeah. Maker email. Return this user email. I'm just going to like slowly drive my way out of the Demeter hell by just deleting these one at a time and working through it. So now we can go to the purchase and uh, look at the product and this gets us the user which is probably not that. Here's the maker name. We'll go maker email return this user email and we get the user through here which goes through the product so that's cool green and then let's just put it right on the event so fails fulfillment failed email who a constructor we will need that oh wait fulfillment failed event what am i talking about 
Huh. Comment. Yeah. Unfulfillment, unfulfillment, f- fulfillment, and unfulfillment email. It sounds like the most sad email ever. <laughs> unfulfilled. Un- unfulfilled email. Return this purchase maker email. Green. Okay. Now, this isn't obviously perfect because we haven't actually made this uh, fulfillment failed email like real or useful in any way. Um, so we can think about adding another assertion there. But what I want to do next actually was show that if instead here we just did fulfillment failed. I don't want to type all that. Come on. Dispatch with the purchase. That this is going to fail because that listener isn't actually listening for that event. So I think I actually would prefer to have this test written this way, even though it's less unity. It creates a problem if we have multiple listeners listening to this event, because then other stuff that we might not necessarily want to happen is going to happen. But for now, I think it's okay. So let's look at the event service provider and uh, wire up our fulfillment failed class to our fulfillment failed listener class. Do you know why in, in, in here he has it using strings and not the class? Probably because like this use list gets completely out of control otherwise. Hmm. You know? Unnecessary characters. It's kind of like that with the app service provider or whatever it was it used to have yeah. them all imported then it just did them all in line yeah i think yeah, cause like, i used to, i just use the full namespace in there i don't use the use use statement but like this fully qualified class name like this sort of thing yeah yeah too bad it doesn't prefix that with the uh yeah kind of to me that. that seems a bit more readable i don't know why because like especially if you have any all events that kind statements. of sound similar yeah i, I can get behind can that What's that? Sorry. Service provider and, and drill in easier. Mm. Especially if you're using an IDE, right? Yeah. Or Sublime, you know, whatever. Mm. All right. So, what else do we want to assert about? The email thing is always Make kind of sure. tricky because, like, for the most part, I don't really care that much about. For example, asserting that email has a specific subject or that it has specific text. I mostly just care that it was like built the right way so that when I try to use the data that it has, when I'm trying to design the email, um, that it's the right data, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. So I think probably the only other thing I care about here is like verifying that the um, mailable has a reference to the purchase because that's probably what we needed to have, right? I feel like from there we can kind of get everything else because it's uh, the fulfillment for the specific purchase failed and we have the purchase here so we want to be able to verify that mail purchase if we make it public so it's accessible in the thing is uh, dude have I ever spelt purchase correctly on one of these streams I don't think so this time yeah, I tried to use a those. four instead of a dollar. Like I do P U R H every single time. Why well, you just embrace that spelling then? Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, let's go over to this class and we'll rename this purchase. <laughs> per case. Yeah. You know the scary thing is there's probably lots of apps out there that just have typos consistently. Oh, you mean like mine? Autocomplete and stuff. But not even typos that like you catch and fix. It's like I typoed it once and then I just used autocomplete for the rest of the time that I built the app. That's why you shouldn't use PHP Storm. Yeah, you have to use Vim. Yep. Okay, so no uh, thing there. <laughs> so this is going to take a purchase. I wish this, um, this uh, Sublime PHP companion thing always adds properties above the traits. Sort of gruesome. Get out of here. Come on. Get out of here. Get out of here. (laughs) 
Larry, it does autocomplete for me already. Check this out. Purr. <laughs> It's just sublime, like, being uh, kind to me. All right. So this is probably going to pass now. No. Missing argument for the constructor. I guess in the listener, we should probably pass that through. So let's say event purchase. Tests are so good. It lets me be so stupid. Cannot access private property. Okay. If I had type hints, I'd be going around in the browser and verifying that things are broken instead of have tests. <laughs> All right, so that's green. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, so that's all good. Um, I'm sort of wondering like, if there's a way to like make this less lame. Because it kind of sucks to have uh, have to create like all t three of these things just because like we need a purchase made by like a specific person. So like one solution to this right is to say the purchase equals mockery um, mock purchase. Holy fuck! <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting what sound. Was that? <laughs> Okay, yes. Uh, what ha what happened? Something happened. We could say that this should return maker at example.com. Now this part would fail. Um which does make that like sort of an interesting situation. Uh you could do some weird mockery thing, you know what I mean? Like we could say this is uh You can say like it should have actually I think the only way to do this is to say like purchase ID equals um, you know ninety nine or something. And then you could say mail purchase ID equals ninety nine. And I bet you this won't work, but <laughs> um it's interesting anyways. Let's just see. One error set attribute does not exist on this mock object so this is because trying to mock eloquent stuff in any way is just painful um one way that i've seen people do it is to do like a set relation and by seeing people i mean i do sometimes <laughs> uh so if we did like um this and we had like a mock product so we could say like product equals mockery um mock products class and then this one we could say that the product when asked for its maker email because we have that there as well should return maker at example.com and then when we create the purchase we could just use make, give it like a fixed ID of like 99 or whatever. And then we could say purchase set relation product product. And this might also fail, but it's kind of interesting. Let's see if we can make it pass, it'd be kind of interesting. Get attribute does not exist on this mock object. So we still have that weird thing where because it's trying to um, use the attribute accessor. Yeah, like well, it's almost better, honestly, to do this. Like that might make it work. Undefined property mockery user purchase seventeen. Purchase seventeen. Oh, because this goes through to user emails. Okay, so we're mocking the wrong... Not mocking the wrong thing, but the product has to return a user that then returns that. So the whole thing is really stupid. And it's not actually ever going to be better than this would be. 
because of the fact that we can't set the ID um, easily. So this will have to do. If I was going to do anything to, to make this simpler, I'd probably create like a shared helper that just lets me create a purchase and specify information about one of its like somewhat distant relationships, which is something I have done in the past. But since this is the only place that we use it, it doesn't really matter. And uh, this is broken. You could do like a wait, uh, a weird fake object that has a, some sort of, you know, get magic methods on it and it automatically grabs what you want. Oh, you know what we could do too? Um, okay, we'll try one more thing. <laughs> so we can say like purchase equals mockery mock. And just don't mock anything because I don't use type hints anyways. So that's like the whole reason that we're actually having that problem is because mockery to pass the ty type hints is trying to extend this class and all this weird stuff. So here we could just say that this maker email uh, should return maker at example.com and then we can say purchase ID equals 99 and then we could say the purchase ID should be 99 and then if we run this we get a syntax error on line 36 because that's not really PHP and then it passes so as long as we don't use type hints <coughs> amazingly we can mock this class wow I thought there was zero benefits to using type hints and they only ever made your code better and not using them only makes your code worse. Weird. Weird that we found out something that you can do without using them that you can't do if you use them. How yeah, bizarre. Not the database, which is even I, more wild. I know. Now we don't even need the database. We can just do this. Guys, I'm not comfortable with any of this. <laughs> Anyways, I don't like this because it couples me to fetching the email in a specific way i'd rather pay the tax of like the complex setup uh, to be able to know that i can refactor that to get the email from any of those relationships if i decide i don't want to keep around that big demeter chain it kind of also helps thing. document your document what's going on a little bit more yeah the only problem is like if you change something that makes this setup not valid and you've done this in a bunch of places like that sucks. Um, but again, you can alleviate that a little bit by having like a different helper for creating a purchase and, and putting all this in one place. So like, I think I've done something like that here. This is not quite like that, but um, you can see I'm doing fancy stuff in the factory to like check if a product ID comes through then I find it's that product like and I use the data for that product to fill things like amount and subtotal. If they right. don't pass through a product ID, then I create a product and I get the amount that they used for the purchase to make the product worth the same amount as the purchase. Mm. Like there's just some interesting things that you could do. Like even if you just had... Even if you decided, like, I'm not going to use factories directly in my tests, and instead I'm going to use these inside some other helpers, you can have a function that's like, um, like create purchase, and this could be like purchase data, and then you could have like maker email, you know what I mean? Yep. And then I could reuse this anywhere that I wanted to, and at least then I would only have to change this logic in one place. I mean this programming 101 i guess make a yeah, in my app i just made a trait and just used it in the classes where i needed it and did the same thing everywhere yeah cool all right man and man i think uh that's probably as much as we'll do today that's like an hour so we were able to uh make sure that our thingy there uh fires that event and that whenever that event's fired that we send this email and then uh i'll probably go and make this email a little bit fancier uh, so that we can actually like see it work in the browser when the webhook thing uh, fails. If we had a little bit more time, we could do that right now, but I don't want to take it longer than an hour because it's always fun to do stuff with TDD without ever using the browser and then go and check it in the browser and it works the first try. <laughs> 
Cool. Well, thanks for joining me, fellas. And thanks to everybody to come hang out in the uh, chat on the YouTubes there. And hopefully it was uh, some fun stuff. And we'll be back on Tuesday. See ya, folks.